So a couple of postscripts um, from last week. I was talking about the passage in Jeremiah 29, it's verses 6 and following, um, where Jeremiah is writing a letter to the exiles in Babylon and says, um, seek the welfare of the city that you're in. Seek the shalom, right, of the city that you're in. For in its shalom, you will find your shalom, right? And as I mentioned, the context of that is that there were other Jewish people, prophets in Babylon, who were saying, no, don't, don't get settled in. Uh, you're going to go back real soon. We're going to go back and we're going to rebuild the temple. And uh, Jeremiah says, no, um, you're not. Not for a while. And uh, what I didn't point out with was that, you know, four or five verses later, there's this verse that all of us know, Jeremiah 29, 11, which says what? All right, you guys know that verse. I know the plans I have for you, right? To give you a future and a hope. Well, your future right now, Israel, is in Babylon. This is where you're, where you're called to be. This is where God wanted them to be. Um, yes, there's going to be other you know, hopeful things down the road, but um, I, was, I was glad a couple of Sundays ago, I think Jeff was preaching, and he was talking about how people complained about Seattle, um, our local Babylon, I guess. <clears throat> people complain about it. It's like, well, you know, maybe God calls some people to, uh, to live there, to work there, to, to try to reach people who are in some of the darker places. Um, and it takes a lot of creativity. Um, to be a light in the darkness sometimes takes uh, a little bit of stepping out. There's a, a book our SALT group is going through now. It's called Uncommon Ground, Living Faithfully in a World of Difference. Um, Timothy Keller is one of the editors of that. And he knows uh, better than a lot of people how to do that kind of ministry because he started the church in the middle of New York City. And uh, it's, a, it's a great ministry that he has there in which he has you know, groups of artists, you know, musicians, jazz musicians come to the church and uh, writers and filmmakers and uh, just reaches out to the community. And one of the authors, um, it's several chapters by different people in different um, uh, categories. So this is a category, uh, The Adventurer. And Tom Lynn uh, is the, was the president of InterVarsity uh, Christian Fellowship. He says, today I still observe cultural dissidents on university campuses, but I am encouraged by how this student generation is responding to it. For example, InterVarsity's chapter at Washington University in St. Louis recently noticed the growth of non-religious and atheist students. Rather than being fearful, which is something that First Peter talks about quite a bit, the chapter saw this cultural dissonance as an opportunity. They believed that atheist students would be open to conversation and relationship. So one day, the Christians knocked on the door of the Free Thinkers Society meeting and asked the atheists to join them for a weekend of community service in St. Louis. The atheists responded, sure, that sounds like an adventure. As they worked alongside one another, they talked and listened. They built relationships as they shared their experiences. They grew in trust and respect. A few weeks later, the chapter, university chapter, heard a knock on the door of their weekly Bible study. It was members of the Free Thinker Society. Can we do Bible study together? <laughs> Stepping out, right? Being creative. Not being fearful of what people might say or how they might respond. So I think it's really good as, as believers that we get involved in various organizations. Um, my wife went through a master gardener program, and so she has meetings with master gardeners and uh, ladies and men, um, most of whom you know, don't seem to be believers, 
um, but she rubs shoulders with them. She's able to show the love of Christ to them, and it opens doors. So, okay, <clears throat> so we're going to uh, move into this section here, a little bit longer section. Um, in the general admission we went over last week, 11 through 17, uh, Peter starts out talking about submission to every human institution, or in the Greek, every creation of God. Um, and now he's going to move from kind of a focus on government and uh, obeying and honoring government to more specific uh, relationships in the home. And what he's doing here is something that was fairly common in the Greco-Roman uh, ethical discourse uh, where you would have something which we call a um, household code or a household duty code, okay? Where uh, instructions are given for how to uh, live and, and manage a household and usually starts at the top and you start with the paterfamilias, the, the father of the house. Uh, you work down the mother, the children, and then the slaves in the house. And uh, these, these would be instructions and shared kind of expectations, customs, uh, status, relationships in the home, responsibilities of each member, um, all the way down, you know, from the father down to, to the slave. Now, what happens, uh, you know, when Christianity comes on the scene, uh, you know, what happens when one member of that household becomes a believer and the others don't, right? Or say... You know, a wife maybe becomes a believer and a slave becomes a believer. Um, that leads to a lot of significant challenges in the early church um, because some of the commitments that we have as believers threaten the hierarchy of the family. It threatens the status of the family. And... Uh, and so as I say there at the end of that, this in turn would lead to suspicion of the new religion and concern that its beliefs and practices might undermine the traditional allegiances and hierarchical power structures within the home and the empire. Okay. So that little quote there on the right is Paul in Thessalonica. Okay. He's on his uh, second missionary journey and runs into some uh, conflict there, preaching the gospel. And here's what people say about them. These people who have been turning the world upside down have come here also. They are all acting contrary to the decrees of the emperor, saying there is another king named Jesus. Okay. You know, this is an early period of, of Christian mission. And in another generation, at the end of the first century, in 95, 96, you're going to have the book of Revelation where you can see there's a lot more tension between government and the church and a lot more persecution than what we're finding uh, in First Peter. So notice that. They've turned the world upside down, right? They recognize it. <laughs> Paul's preaching an upside-down kingdom, isn't he? And, uh, and there is another king, and that's very threatening. And so we get to now these very specific instructions, uh, starting off with slaves. I'll go ahead and uh, read 18 through 20 first. Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. So uh, Paul, if you read Paul's letters, particularly Ephesians and Colossians, he has household codes there, right? Fathers or husbands, wives, children, and so on. Peter's actually just going to focus here on slaves first, then wives, and then one verse for husbands. Um, which we'll talk about. But uh, what Peter seems to be doing is he wants to address those in the household who are facing the greatest difficulty in serving Jesus and, and living out their faith within a pagan household. Um, so those who face the greatest opposition from unbelievers. So he starts with those who have the least power and the least status in the, in the home. 
slaves. Addresses them directly, which would be very unusual in a household code. Usually you're telling the husband what he needs to do and what he needs to tell everyone in the household to do. Uh, but here, Peter's directly addressing slaves. And, uh, and then he uses the example of Christ's sufferings as a model for how to deal with unjust and undeserved treatment. So some of our translations are not very clear here. Um, when Peter says to accept the authority, or the NIV says, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, right? It's actually the word fear, phobos. He's not talking about fearing the master. He's talking about fearing God. You're doing this because of your reverence and your fear of God, not your fear of that person, okay? And you can tell that because in in verse 19, it says, um, what credit is to you being aware of God, okay? Now, in that time period, of course, slavery was like electricity. Nobody ever thought of getting rid of it. Um, you know, it was, it was like cars. And, uh, and so there are a lot of slaves in the Roman Empire. And it's very different from the slavery we're familiar with because it's not based on ethnicity or or uh, race, or color, or anything like that. And actually, some slaves could be quite high up in society. You could have uh, slaves who were freed, freedmen, right? Slaves were doctors, slaves were teachers. Um, no, not all of them were. So, I mean, they're obviously going to be slaves at the bottom of the ladder. But probably about a third or a fourth of the empire uh, would be slavery, slaves, Okay. There's one uh, Roman senator who had 400 slaves on his estate, okay? So you think about that, and and that a lot of these uh, slaves, as they they come into the church, right? Wow, I'm free in Christ? (laughs) You know, I can get my freedom in Christ. And uh, and so what does that mean now? I'm free in Christ, but now I've still got a human master. How How do I live out my faith in that kind of situation? Um, And so I'm going to read the next section, 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. So he tells slaves that they need to bear up under this kind of unjust treatment. And he says, to this you are called. And and the one thing as we're reading through this section to really keep in mind is that even though Peter's addressing this to specific people or specific groups, in other parts of the letter, he says the same thing to all believers. Okay? So if we go back to verse 16 in chapter 2, in addressing all the saints, he says, as servants or slaves of God live as free people, right? We're all slaves. We're all servants. And so I think it's interesting that Peter spends a significant amount of time addressing slaves here. Um, And in the next chapter, Peter says, do not repay evil for evil or abuse for abuse because to this you were called. Okay, it's the exact same phrase in the Greek as what he's just said to slaves. To this you are called. We're all called to be cross bearers, right? We're all called to that kind of discipleship. So the example of Jesus responding to violence against himself with willing suffering and death is not a unique event in God's plan. Jesus' actions, excuse me, and attitude towards violence reflect a fundamental aspect of God's character and will, which Christians are to model. 
And to illustrate this, Peter will tie Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant to specific events in the passion narrative recorded later in the Gospels. So it's interesting. I mean, most of us are probably familiar with with Isaiah 53, um, the suffering servant passage. Peter is actually the only New Testament book to really unpack that. Okay, there are kind of little allusions in other places, Acts chapter 8, uh, Ethiopian eunuchs reading from Isaiah 53. But Peter is really the only one to, to really address this and, and, and teach about it. And what does it mean? What are the implications of Jesus, what Jesus went through? And there are only two Old Testament books that talk about the Messiah's suffering, right? So there's Isaiah 53, or 52 and 53, and Psalm 22. And uh, when, you, when you read early Christian literature, you see that those two, two spots in, in the Old Testament were often used in apologetics, in, especially in apologetics dealing with Jewish believers, or Jewish uh, unbelievers, I guess we could say. Um, yeah? Yes, that, that would be, um, what he's doing is he's, he's, it's not so much elevating, is that he's leveling the relationships within the church, right? So if you read Philemon, right, a little letter about a slave that ran away and went to Paul, he says to Philemon, who's the slave owner, um, Philemon, uh, he mentions his son Archippus, he mentions the wife, this is a household that seems to be a church, so a church is meeting in their house, and uh, Philemon wasn't, or uh, Onesiphorus, uh, who was the slave, which it, it's a very common slave name, which just means useful. <laughs> hey, useful. <laughs> Come on, I need you for something, all right? Um, in that letter, Paul says to Philemon, treat Onesiphorus as you would me. Treat the slave as you would the apostle. Okay. Um, so it's interesting you bring that up. My, one of my mentors, um, Richard Bauckham, and he's talking here about the household codes in Ephesians and Colossians. He says um, in Ephesians, masters are told to do the same to their slaves. Okay, Slaves are told to do this. And then Paul goes around, uh, turns it around. He says, Masters, I want you to do the same to your slaves. Can you imagine that? The reference can only be to rendering service as a slave. In other words, if the slaves are told to be good slaves to their masters, as to the master, right? The masters are also told to be slaves to their slaves, as to the master. Presumably, they are to exercise their authority in a way which is just as much a service to their slaves as the slaves' work is a service to them. Such advice taken seriously would mean that the continuing outward form of freedom and subjection would be inwardly transformed by the new Christian principle of freedom in mutual service. It should also be noticed that the way the master-slave relationship is here transcended is not by making everyone masters, but by what? Making everyone slaves. Okay. And and so that's that's part of what Peter is 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 addressing here. Um, so servants and the serving suffering servant, right? We are all servants. So and then Jesus is the suffering servant. So that Peter chooses to address Christian slaves with his first and longest exhortation and exposition of the household duty codes is entirely appropriate, since slaves best embody the upside-down kingdom model expressed in the life and teachings and death of Jesus Christ, right? So when you read through the Gospels, Jesus is often expressing these reversal statements, right? The first shall be what? The greatest shall be the least, or the greatest shall be the servant, right? Uh, And so a slave here is kind of an embodiment, really, of of how the kingdom of God is is viewed. Um, More specifically, Peter draws out parallels between the experience of Jesus and the affliction of slaves, who likewise had to endure unjust sufferings and beatings, were tempted to respond with verbal retaliation and threats. So throughout this section, that second section that I read, 
Um, if you if you know if you had your Bibles out and if you knew, you know, Hebrew and Greek, uh, you could see how he's just kind of weaving passages from Isaiah fifty three throughout this, and and I wanted you to to see that. So I, in that quote box, um, I kind of adapted this from Karen Jove's great commentary on First Peter. Um, so everything in bold is uh, quotations from Isaiah 53. Everything in italics is allusions, okay, that you might not pick up just from reading it, but you'd have to kind of go back. Um, Christ also suffered on your behalf, leaving you an example. Okay, and that word example is really interesting because it's like when, you're, when you were teaching kids in that time period, you, you would carve letters out of a, a, a block, right? And then the kid would trace the letters. And so the idea is that this is a model. This is an example. You're supposed to fit yourself right into that, right? Just exactly what Jesus did. You're supposed to live that out. Who did not commit sin, neither was deceit. Okay, so this word's going to come up quite a bit. In, in It already has in First Peter. Um, dolos, deceit, was found in his mouth who, when verbally abused, did not retaliate. So that's from Isaiah 53. When he suffered, he did not make threats, Isaiah 53, but instead trusted. So even just like one little word there. The one who judges justly, who himself bore our sins. So there we have a quote. In his body upon the tree. So literally in 1 Peter, it doesn't say cross, but all your translations will say cross. Um, But it's it's the tree, and the tree was understood to be a cross, right? Um, So that having no involvement with sins, we might live for righteousness, by whose wounds you were healed, another quotation, for you were like wandering sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Wow. Okay. So you notice, like, you know, how he's just using these passages from Scripture, and he doesn't use them in the same order as Isaiah 53, but when you read the passion narrative in the Gospels, right, and how Jesus responds and the kinds of things that he goes through, he's following that story. And he's, he's connecting Isaiah 53 to the story of Jesus' passion. And this response of slaves, as I was talking about, how this is kind of a model of the upside-down kingdom and the model of of how Jesus himself lived, right? Paul says the same thing. I put a quote there from Philippians 2. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptying himself, taking the form of a slave. Okay, some of your translations say servant, but probably, I mean, it's, the word doulos can be translated either servant or slave. But here I think that the contrast is so great who in very nature God, right, then took on the lowest possible status there would be within the culture. So Peter's emphasis here um, is really a lot on speech, on how do we respond verbally to people, okay? So um, his summary of Christ's experience of rejection and mistreatment is repeated emphasis on verbal responses, non-retaliation. And, you know, we all know that this was something that Jesus taught about quite a bit, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, uh, do not uh, speak against them. Um, And so it's also modeled in the way that Jesus goes through the Passion, right? When Jesus was abused, did he speak out? No. Could he have? (laughs) He did not retaliate. Matter of fact, he he didn't retaliate. He actually prayed for his persecutors, didn't he? So this seems purposely chosen to address the particular circumstances of those Peter is addressing. Since the hostility they are facing from unbelievers has not yet risen to the point of physical harm or official government sanctions and persecution. Okay, we're still in an early period of the church here. Um, we're still in a period where a lot of Roman, Greco-Roman authorities don't see Christianity as a separate religion from Judaism, right? So they just think it's a sect of Judaism, and that's going to change. Um, 
And so there's, uh, as far as we can tell, we're going to talk about this a little bit more in a couple of weeks. Um, what's the context of suffering that Peter's talking about, which he's going to address later uh, in, in the book. We're going to talk about the context, the historical context there. Um, you had a few one-off kind of persecutions. You had Claudius kicking the Jews out of Rome. You had Nero. We're not sure about the date of First Peter, but Nero in 64 persecuting Christians in Rome. Um, so as exiles and foreigners, they are experiencing suspicion, public slander, social rejection, which naturally triggers normal human defense mechanisms that result in counterattacks and defensive measures or the opposite extreme of withdrawal from society. Okay, Peter's concerned about this. Um, no, I don't want you to speak back. I don't want you to retaliate verbally, but I also don't want you to withdraw from society and become a, you know, a monk or a, a Dead Sea Scroll a scene, you know, who creates their own little community out here. Um, you want to be part of the culture. You want to get involved, stay involved with the culture. Um, moving to the back then. As, a, as you read through the book of 1 Peter, you can kind of highlight, you know, what are people actually facing? What are slaves facing? What are Christians facing from unbelievers at this stage of, of mission? So on the left, we have, you know, what Peter talks about, pagan acquisitions and threats. Uh, and then on the right, you have how the believers are supposed to respond. Though they malign you as evildoers. Peter says, rid yourselves of all malice, and all deceit, so here's this word that is used for Jesus, right? And slander of every kind. Then he talks about those who speak against them maliciously. Do not repay evil or evil with evil or insult with insult but with blessing. And then he quotes from one of his favorite psalm, which he quotes quite a bit, Psalm 34. Let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. So here's this word again, deceit, dolos, right? Peter says, who will harm you? Do not fear what they fear. Do not be intimidated. Okay, well, they're obviously getting intimidated, right? They're obviously starting to feel fearful. And so this is a passage we're going to unpack a little bit more next week. Be prepared to give an answer, yet do it with what? gentleness, and respect. Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, but rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings. Okay? So here he's not even talking to slaves in chapter 4, right? He's talking to all believers, that not just slaves are sharing in Christ's sufferings, but all believers who go through these kinds of trials and slander um, are sharing Christ's sufferings and need to respond in the same way that Christ did. Um, they are surprised that you no longer join them in the same excesses, and so they blaspheme. It's a, it's a fun passage there that we're going to go over. You know, how come you Christians don't party with us anymore? You know, how come you're not at all these feasts and you know, raves and keggers and... Um, it was a whole list of interesting things there, which we'll look at. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed. If any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace. Okay? Um, that word Christianos um, is only used three times in the New Testament. And it wasn't something that Christians coined for themselves. It was what outsiders called them. Partisans of Christ. Okay. So it was actually it was a negative term um, in that time period. All right, moving to the next topic, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Uh, let me read that. Wives, in the same way, accept the authority of your husbands, so that even if some of them do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by their wise conduct, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Do not adorn yourselves outwardly by braiding your hair, by wearing gold ornaments or fine clothing. Rather, let your adornment be the inner self with the lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in God's sight. 
It was in this way a long, uh, long ago that the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by accepting the authority of their husbands. Thus Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. You have become her daughters as long as you do what is good and never let fears alarm you. So he moves from slaves with unbelieving masters to Christian wives with unbelieving husbands. And very purposely, he's addressing you know, this next group because they're the next group of least powerful people within the family. Um, and this is really important to understand this, this cultural context here. Uh, there's a strong cultural expectation in Greco-Roman society that wives and slaves in a household would simply adopt the religious practices of the paterfamilias. Okay? So whatever the husband worships, wherever temple he goes to, whatever sacrifices he gives to, whatever god or goddess, you're expected to fall in line with that. Whether you're the wife or the slave or the children. For a wife to go against that tradition and become involved in a strange new religion which worshipped a crucified Jewish criminal could have serious public and private consequences for the authority and honor of the husband. The chief responsibility of the wife, so you have the pater familias, right, and then you have the mater familias, was the care and management of the home. And so even cultivating friendships outside the home was frowned upon. You can see a quote there from Plutarch, that he's a contemporary of, of Peter, um, pagan writer. A wife ought not to make friends of her own, but to enjoy her husband's friends in common with him. The gods are the first and most important friends. Wherefore, it is becoming for a wife to worship and to know only the gods that her husband believes in, to shut the front door tight upon all queer rituals and outlandish superstitions, which is, which is certainly what Christianity appeared to a lot of people in that world. Um, Toby, you can put up that picture of the lolarium, the, the little house. No, not that one. Sorry, I have them in the wrong order. Um, okay, so this is called a lar- lararium. So every Roman house um, would have one of these little shrines, and it's, it, it depicts it like a temple, right? It's like a mini temple in your house. It's in, in the front room, and every morning you go and service this thing. And you've got these little figurines, little metal, usually metal figurines, of some of the gods and goddesses, right? And that they're protectors of the home. Um, Mercury, okay, Mercury's the, the god of wealth. And so if you want to have an, uh, you know, it's like their prosperity gospel kind of god, you know. Um, Hercules was really popular because, you know, you want strength. And, and so you have all these little figurines there, and you have a bowl, you light a lamp, you, you have incense, you pour out wine. And this is a ritual you do every single day, okay? And it's kind of like a, like a, a a microcosm of the worship that you would do in a big temple. Yeah. So is it the husband that does this? Often the wife would do this, uh, but the husband could do it. He would be kind of the overseer of it. So she's still required to be Christian. Uh, yeah. So yeah, can you imagine that? No, honey, I'm not really, you know... <laughs> I'm really into that. Um, or the kids going, hey, how come mom doesn't, you know, pour out the wine anymore, you know, to, to the gods? Um, there's a little quote here from Cicero. The most sacred, the most hallowed place on earth is the home of each and every citizen. There are his sacred hearth and his household gods. There, the very center of his worship, religion, and domestic ritual. Okay. I mean, all of these little gods, and, and they were very important, okay? If you, ever, if you ever read about Pompeii, right? You guys know what happened to Pompeii? All right, so Vesuvius. So people are fleeing their homes. What are they taking with them? They're grabbing their little trinkets, their gods, right? They found people like dead with this in their hand. Wow. Okay. Um, so now think about the challenges, right, of, of a wife in that kind of situation. 
Imagine then what it would look like for wives to embrace an alternate family of believers, the church, gather with them for worship, all the while ignoring the daily rituals and traditions associated with pagan worship in the home. Peter's advice for wives in such situations is to let their respect and blameless way of life, so there's this word I've talked about, which Peter mentions quite a bit, way of life, be the adornment that attracts their unbelieving husbands to the gospel. Okay? So adornment there, it's the word cosmos, right? We, we've talked about that because it can mean world, um, but there's also a verb cosmeo, which, what word do we get from that? Cosmetics, yeah. Cosmetics, bling, right? He's saying, don't let your, uh, don't attract your husbands through wearing all kinds of bling, right? Attract them through your, your way of life, your modesty. You don't need all that stuff. And it's the same thing, like in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul talks about um, husbands and wives who are, are in a, um, a mixed marriage, right? People who have become believers, and then maybe when their other partner did not become a believer. And he has this great principle there, which, which I call collateral holiness, right? How do you know unbelieving wife, you know, whether you're, not, you're going to influence your husband? So in some sense, Paul sees, let's say the wife is a believer, right? And, and the husband's not. He's, he, when you read that passage, it's so fascinating because here is a, a former Pharisee saying that holiness trumps unholiness, right? That the, the husband is somehow set apart within the household. And, and he doesn't say they're saved. He says, how do, how do you know whether you will save them or not? You don't know. But, you know, and it's the same way. He's, he kind of evens it out. He says, husband, how do you know if you save your wife, right? But the, the power of the spirit, the power of the gospel is more powerful than unbelief and paganism. Collateral holiness. So inner beauty versus outward adornment. Um, so Paul says the same thing. I mean, this is a common issue in that time period. We find a similar ex- exhortation in 1 Timothy. Women should dress themselves modestly and decently in suitable clothing, not with hair braided or with golden pearls or expensive clothes, but with good works as is proper for women who profess reverence for God. Well, I mean, when you study that culture in that time period, this is a, a period in which there's, there's almost like this women's liberation movement. And, and there's this phrase, you know, the new Roman woman. Um, and uh, so and it particularly was women of means because, you know, who, who's going to afford, you know, fancy clothes and, and gold and jewels and all that. But it was, was a very, you know, common movement. So they're leaving behind, women are leaving behind their kind of traditional roles, their attitudes, becoming involved outside the home. So, yeah, so if you're not in the home, uh, then you think more about your appearance, don't you? You think more about your fancy dress and how you're going to look to other people. They get involved in politics, business, and religion. So along with this came a greater focus on personal beautification and adornment. Um, yeah, now you can show those other pictures. Okay, so, so women would spend, yeah, hours upon hours and, and to, to do some of these hairstyles, right? This one, I think, is Roman... Uh, what's the next one? Well, that one's Greek. Um, so a statue. Uh, and then the other one's a fresco, I think. Yeah, so this is from Pompeii. Um, but notice all the little curls. I mean, how long would that take to do? You spend half your day at the, at the beauty shop. Um, and as reading it, that it took a modern person or modern beauty shop uh, lady a lot of research and, and experimentation in order to figure out how they did this kind of stuff. Okay. So they recreate? Yeah, there are some recreations of that. Um, and so this, this is something that, you know, wasn't just a, a Christian concern. So I have a quote there from uh, Fintis, is a woman, it's interesting, a woman philosopher who says a good woman will avoid excessive ornament, luxury, and superfluous clothes and not decorate her person with gold and emeralds. Rather, she will adorn her person with modesty. 
Well, it's the same word that Paul uses in 1 Timothy. We should address, women should address themselves modestly. Okay. Yeah. In, in, in light of that, would it be fair to say that, that because you have these different levels, to, um, that w- whatever level you're at in dress, that your Christian you know, obedience or, or, or glory should outshine that level? Yes. Let's say there's a, there's a senator's wife. She's expected to dress a certain way, but in that dress, to to let her Christian emphasis out, outshine that so that, that she has more of an inward expression of modesty than not necessarily a, tied to how she fixes her hair or the clothes she wears? Yes, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's prohibition for that. And of course, you're thinking about your, your wife and her sister who create jewelry. Um, <laughs> They got some great jewelry. My wife wears earrings from them. So, um, but it's godly bling, right? <laughs> yeah. See, um, yeah. I mean, there are some. When I, I talked about this quite a bit when I did first the First Timothy passage, and I read some quotes from from early Christian writers who go way off on a tangent about this, but and some of it's very hilarious. Um, Peter's model here is based on the ideal wife of the Jewish home as the example of Sarah underscores. The inward qualities of humility, gentleness, and respect are more important for winning over a spouse than the typical fancy dress of Greco-Roman woman. Right? So yeah, it's a matter of balance, right? There. Um, now I think it's interesting when you go back and you read Genesis and you read the story of the relationship between Abraham and Sarah. Um, you know, she wasn't always obedient <laughs> to him, and sometimes she was obedient when maybe she shouldn't have been. Right? Hey, you know, go go to Pharaoh, and uh, you know, I'll tell him you're my sister. Well, it's kind of a half truth because she is his half sister. Um. But when you read the whole story, you see that uh, Genesis records that Abraham also obeyed Sarah three times, with God telling Abraham at one point, do as she tells you. Wow, sometimes we husbands need some kind of divine cue like that. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) Yes, dear. I just had a revelation from God. (laughs) I need to obey you. Um... And then, you know, one verse about Christian husbands, 3.7. Husbands, in the same way, show consideration for your wives um, in your life together, paying honor to the woman as the weaker sex, since they too are also heirs of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing may hinder your prayers. Okay, so why six verses for women and one verse for men? Well, that's obvious. Okay, remember what I said earlier about the expectations. The wife is supposed to follow the religion of the husband. If the husband becomes a Christian, then in a lot of cases, the wife would then also follow the religion of of the believing husband. So... Whereas a typical Greco-Roman household code of the period would instruct a husband in getting the wife to obey, Peter exhorts husbands to be sensitive and considerate. Okay, it's the same thing Paul does in, in Ephesians 5, uh, which is an interesting passage because people uh, often misread that passage um, and forget 521. They start with 522 where it says, be submissive, except the word submissive is not in the Greek. Um, the word submission there comes from the previous verse, which says everybody in the church should be submissive to each other. And the wife verse is like a bullet point, right? All be submissive, all be servants, all be slaves to each other. Just as the wife was called to treat her husband with respect and honor, so it is to be mutual from husband to wife. In terms of their spiritual standing, there is to be no hierarchical inequality, for they are both fellow heirs of the gracious gift of life. 
In fact, a husband who neglects this would jeopardize his devotional relationship with God since our vertical spiritual relationship with God is fundamentally connected to our horizontal earthly relationships. Okay? So I kind of call this the, the worship triangle, right? Uh, so there's God, um, there's us, there's others. Um, it's really important that you know this works together here. It's not just us and God, right? And I mean, even going all the way back to Genesis, right? It's not good that Man should be alone, right? Hey, Adam, you know, you and I, we can just kind of have a cool time together. And God says, no, no. <laughs> it's really important um, that you think about other people. And so we, we see this here is that this could affect your devotional life um, if you're not treating your spouse in the right way. Um, the weaker sex, so the translation I just read is the NRSV, right? Okay, this is, like, this is like the scholar's study Bible, right? This is what most New Testament scholars or biblical scholars would use. Uh, Harper T- Collins or, you know, anything that has the NRSV has the Apocrypha in it. And it's so ironic to me that it has this translation, the weaker sex, okay? It's not, it's a very, it's, it's not a great translation. And, and, and it's so ironic because this is like what most scholars use. And it's, it's in, inaccurate. So virtually all other translations avoid this, rendering the Greek word skuos. Okay, skuos is a word that means vessel. It could be a pot, um, but it could also be used in a metaphorical way for the body. And it could be both men and women's bodies or whatever, right? So most other translations will translate this vessel, King James, ESV, or partner, NIV, or give some kind of roundabout paraphrase. Amplified Bible, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, or the message, as women, they lack some of your advantages. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, Most commentators see it kind of as an allusion to a physical disparity between men and women. Okay. But I, I think it's probably broader than that. Um, and when you look at the culture, you see there is a bigger disparity between men and women in various other areas, not just physical strength. So I, I put a quote there from the dictionary of the later New Testament. Greek men around age 30 often married women in their mid-teens, producing a disparity of social and intellectual maturity. Okay, It was not uncommon if a husband had a wife who died in childbirth, to remarry uh, and then lose her again, and then to remarry in his 50s to someone who's 15. Okay, that seems strange to us, but in that time period, in that culture, you know, even leading into the 4th, 5th century AD, it was really common for older men to marry younger women. And, uh, and often the, the women are not taught Right? They're not educated. Uh, and so I think that's part of what goes into this. There's a, a book that Northwest uh, had students read in one of my classes, um, A Week in the Life of a Greco-Roman Woman by Holly Beers. A typical lifespan for men across all social classes is about 40 years, but for women it was closer to 30 years. This was largely due to the dangers of childbearing. Most young women married after puberty, probably around age 12 to 14. Without reliable contraception, pregnancies were the result. Between 10 and 20% of mothers died in childbirth and its related consequences. Only about two-thirds of children lived to age one, while only half of children survived to their fifth birthday. An infant often was not counted as a live birth until it has survived for more than a week. The historical record gives examples of mothers whose survival rates for their children include one out of four or one out of six. Because of this reality, some parents intentionally chose not to bond with young children, deferring affection and relationship until the children were older. So 
Yes, and one of the reasons that, um, that Peter is addressing women here and women, Christian women being a part of the church, they were a big part of the early church, is that um, girl babies were less wanted, right? And so they practice infanticide or abortion. So infanticide would typically, and this book actually gives an example of that, where if you're not wanted as a baby, you're left out in the forest, or you're thrown in the river, or you're left to the wild beasts. And what the early Christians did was, was harvest those babies, right? They would go find those babies, and they would raise them as their own. So, um, but we need to kind of finish up here. One of the things, the issues that this passage brings out um, that is a concern today is, is the issue of spousal abuse. Um, Peter is not suggesting here that wives need to endure physical abuse. Okay, That's not his point. Um, his emphasis has mainly been on verbal things, right? And so you don't want to use this passage, you don't want to uh, like in three one, right? You could read this in the wrong way. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. What do you mean in the same way? In the same way as slaves? You endure a beating? No, that's not what he's saying here. In the same way with reverence and respect for God. There's a good quote from Karen Jobes there. The exhortation for wives to be subject to their own husbands in proximity to the discussion of Jesus as the model for Christian suffering immediately raises the question of whether women should stay in marriages where there is physical abuse. There is nothing in this passage of scripture that would either sanction the abuse of wives or suggest that women should continue to submit themselves to that kind of treatment. In fact, Peter delicately prohibits domestic violence in the exhortation to husbands that immediately follows. In another place, she says, a woman who endured domestic violence would not necessarily be considered a virtuous wife. Okay. And I'm glad Pastor Jeff addressed this when he had his Q&A um, and talked about you know, the issue of domestic violence because it's a, big, it's a big problem and it's a problem in the church as well. But one of the things uh, I I do want to leave you with is that as we're reading these passages, right, uh, especially we're reading in the letters, letters are occasional, right? Letters are written to particular situations. They're written to particular cultural situations. And so we have to ask when we're reading these letters, is what Peter or Paul is saying here normative, right? Does it mean that it's timeless, is it corrective? Is it conditional? Does it have some, something to do with the particular culture of the time period, which doesn't necessarily translate to today? Right? Or thirdly, is it layered? Does it have elements of both? There's a cultural element, right? Uh, but then there's also a, a deeper principle behind the passage. And, and a good example of this would be, so last week Jeff preached on 1 Corinthians 14, right? And he conveniently skipped over the part that says, it's a shame for a woman to speak in church. Yeah. Well, let's see. How should we interpret that? Well, let's go about three chapters earlier in chapter 11, where Paul says it's a shame for a woman to cut her hair. Anybody here ever cut their hair? <laughs> it's the same word in Greek. It's a shame, right? It's a shame for you to cut your hair. Why do we take one passage and say, nah, that's not relevant anymore, and then we look at another passage and go, well, that is. Right? It's hypocritical. We're not looking at the context of things. So, you know, we have to be really careful as, as we're reading through these passages um, to be able to kind of unpack them because God speaks to very specific situations. That's how he works through Scripture. And it's up to us to be responsible interpreters. There. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the challenge of this passage. Um, Help it to spur spur us on to our digging deeper into your word to understand it better for our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen.
about the best. Okay. Hang on. Just the DLNT. Dictionary of the Later New Testament. Of later